what's the connection between uh, international economics and global justice? Uh, I would say that uh, the globalization process, which uh, has been uh, one of the main features of uh, the uh, all national economies uh, over the last uh, couple of uh, years and decades, uh, is such that uh, now there is more and more interdependency between uh, countries. So what is going on in one country, especially in big countries and in powerful countries, has an impact on other countries. And uh, uh, very often uh, you would have something happening in one country with negative effects in uh, part of the population in another country. And uh, there is a sense of justice behind that. Uh, how come, for example, if we look at uh, the uh, recent financial crisis, how come people who are not at all responsible for that crisis, who were moreover living in difficult conditions, would be affected by a crisis which some people consider is due to the predatory uh, behavior of a few uh, uh, agents in uh, uh, developed economies. So from that point of view, there is really a direct link between global justice mm -hmm. and uh, uh, economics and international uh, economics. In essence, you are saying that it's not possible anymore to conceptualize and to address issues of economic and social justice in a given country uh, in a self-contained fashion. Less and less so. Less. Uh, countries depend on each other in a globalized world, basically because they're trading with each other. So if we again look at the recent uh, financial crisis, uh, the African countries, sub-Saharan African countries, had no particular financial or banking problem. And to some extent, from that point of view, they were immune to the crisis. But they were affected by the crisis because the recession in developed countries reduced the volume of trade and reduced the volume of uh, exports from these countries. Mm -hmm. So they were affected even though they had absolutely no responsibility and uh, nothing to do with, with, with the crisis. And, and of course this, uh, this connection existing between the demands of justice at the national level and the inability to address them in a self-contained fashion and this kind of interdependency has been, uh, was brought to the fore by the issue of globalization, right? Of course, yes. Uh, but uh, globalization may be... Uh, you, you might think that uh, any kind of relationship between two countries I'm not sure that we should uh, call them globalization. I mean, relationships between different countries are very old. Mm -hmm. Neighboring countries have always been trading with each other. Uh, you always had migration from a country to another. Uh, and uh, uh, there has been uh, uh, some, uh, when there was a conflict in the country, the uh, neighboring country was affected. This has always been the case. Now, what is new today is the fact that those spillovers are much more important than they were in the past and uh, uh, maybe more uh, serious than they were in the past. Probably the most important uh, uh, spillover and uh, the most important uh, uh, danger that uh, the global economy is facing is the danger of uh, uh, global warming, mm -hmm. uh, the danger of uh, uh, greenhouse uh, gases which are uh, uh, modifying the climate, which will modify the climate in uh, many uh, countries in the world. This is uh, something which is due to economic activity of all okay. countries mm -hmm. in the world. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, you might say that uh, because there is a long memory of uh, emission of greenhouse uh, gases, uh, developed countries today are responsible, given their uh, past, for very much of uh, this uh, pollution of uh, the atmosphere. But today, uh, any country which is uh, emitting uh, CO2 in the atmosphere bears some responsibility mm -hmm. of uh, the global uh, uh, warming. And this is a kind of issue that the uh, globalized world have to consider. Mm -hmm. And you can see that there is really an issue of uh, a normative issue behind that. If we again go back to the environment, uh, countries like uh, China, like uh, African countries will say, you want us to reduce uh, our emissions of uh, CO2 and because of that to uh, slow down our uh, pace of uh, development. 
But we cannot do that. I mean, how come you developed countries are asking us to do that mm -hmm. when you benefited from free uh, emission of uh, pollutants in the atmosphere for so long and uh, when you are bearing the responsibility of the situation we are in? So this is truly a justice problem in the same way as when uh, two neighbors are fighting because one is uh, cutting a tree which was uh, bringing some uh, shade uh, in the other uh, uh, in the garden of the uh, of the neighbor uh, they go to to see the judge but, but it this, is exactly the same thing so but this issue of uh, of uh, environmental uh, i mean it's environmental issues i mean it is as much uh, about the uh, independent nature of, of economic relationship as about, uh, as about the, the nature of the economic paradigm? I'm not sure that the uh, economic paradigm or the model of uh, uh, development has very much to do with that. Uh, so you with don't that. think so, no? no I mean, if uh, you believe that development mm -hmm. is basically something about uh, improving the material conditions of uh, those people who are below some uh, level, uh, then it is needed to uh, produce more goods. Mm -hmm. And in order to produce more goods and more services, we need to uh, spend uh, or to use more energy and therefore to uh, emit more uh, pollutants in the atmosphere. Uh, this is really, uh, or we assume that uh, the uh, regime, the economic regime we uh, find is optimal, is a regime where there will still be poverty, mm -hmm. where there will be still be a lot of inequality mm -hmm. between various parts of the world. No, no, but you have all these debates about green economy, which is about somehow altering a little bit or modifying a little bit the economic model so that precisely the way we okay. produce these things is less polluting. Okay, I completely agree with, with the fact that we certainly need to explore what is possible uh, going in the direction of the green economy, and in particular, what uh, it is possible to do with technical progress, with uh, research, uh, which uh, will indeed green uh, mm -hmm. the way in which we uh, do uh, e economics. But uh, even if uh, uh, it is uh, certainly desirable for developed countries to save on energy to save on uh, uh, CO2 emission, it will be very difficult to avoid uh, emerging countries and developing countries uh, to, do the, uh, to avoid telling uh, those uh, countries to do the same, and this is where the injustice yeah. really is. And, and, and precisely, so you started by, by, by telling us, in fact, that at the key, at the, at the, at the core of this connection existing between international economics and, and, uh, and, and, and justice is the fact that there is this nation, notion of, of independence and with all the spillovers, that it brings about. So what are the various spillovers that we can list in terms of this uh, connection? Uh, okay, so we already uh, insisted yes. very much on environment. Uh, this so that's is one uh, of them which is very important. I would, I would say that today it is almost the most important okay. one. Mm -hmm. uh, it is the most important one in the sense that we don't really know how to handle it. Okay. Okay? And we uh, don't know to handle it in scientific terms, in policy terms, in institutional terms? Yes, uh, in, in, uh, in, in, in all terms. Yes. And uh, I want to call your attention on the fact that if uh, indeed we say that uh, there is a need to uh, save on uh, CO2 emission, and this, uh, if this must be a cost for developing countries, then there is still one way those countries may accept to do that. It is if they are compensated, if they are giving more resources uh, to cover the additional cost of saving on uh, CO2 emission. But this means that developed countries will have to accept themselves to transfer some income, some uh, resources to those countries. And, and so far they are not willing to do so. Exactly. That I mean was that at the very core of the debate taking to, which took place in Copenhagen. Copenhagen was, was exactly about that. And, and I mean chances are that it will be the same story with Rio plus 20. Exa uh, it, exactly that. So yeah. why is it that uh, uh, developed countries are not willing to somehow uh, go along with, uh, this, uh, with, with this idea of shared responsibility in a way? No, I think that with time they'll do it, mm -hmm. uh, but uh, these uh, issues are uh, rather uh, new. Institutions mm -hmm. do not exist to do that. Uh, what is the kind of institution? In a given country, you have institutions which are able to redistribute uh, income or uh, resources from one part of the society to another and the uh, redistribution systems in developed countries, in developing countries, uh, do exist. 
and to some extent national communities rely on the existence of this kind of redistributive mechanism. Mm -hmm. Where are the redistributive mechanism or the redistributive institutions at the global they level? Don't, they don't exist. You could say that uh, development aid is yes. uh, part of, the, of those institutions. You could say that the World Bank, that the IMF, the UN, uh, various agencies of the UN are part of this. But it, but, it, but it, it is very, very limited. In, in, in a way, what you're saying is that you know, ideally we would, we would need a sense of global policy or of policy at the global level, yeah. which is so far lacking. Yeah. Okay. And, but, but this is not an issue only at the global level. Yeah. If you look at uh, all the debate lately on, in Europe, about the way to deal with the crisis yes. in the southern mm -hmm. uh, European countries, it is exactly Ab that. Absolutely. We are missing mm -hmm. instruments to automatically redistribute from one part of Europe to another to part of Europe when yeah. the need uh, appears. Because there is no fiscal integration. Exactly. And, and this is part of the building of a community. Yes. And I believe, I hope that uh, Europe will be able to do it before the world is able to do it, but I believe that the uh, emergency may be more at the global level than, than the European level. level. So one very important spillover, and I understand that the notion of spillover is very, very important in your f way of thinking. So one, uh, one form of spillover is the environmental one. So now what about others? Okay, the so financial one, I guess. Uh, the financial one is completely and, obvious. And, and this is uh, linked to the crisis and so on. Yeah, and, and, and you can see that uh, the, the last crisis, I mean the, the 2008-9 uh, crisis, uh, originated in, in the center of the capitalist system, of the financial system in, in the United States. Uh, previous crises originated somewhere else mm -hmm. in the economy, but there were also very, very strong. Remember the Argentine uh, crisis at uh, the beginning of the, uh, the last decade? Remember the Mexican crisis? Remember the Asian crisis? In all those cases, despite the fact that the crisis was originating in a specific country or a specific group of countries, immediately there was contagion to other countries in the world, and immediately there was risk or there were uh, fears in uh, uh, developed countries in particular that the financial system might go down because some banks were too much exposed to uh, the country which was uh, uh, which, mm. which, which we are fac facing uh, the, this, uh, this crisis. But was it as bad as what happened two years ago? No, I think that uh, these uh, things were not as bad because uh, uh, those economies were uh, less important and then the spillover on other countries were less important. It is true that when you have the big economy like the United States and then uh, Europe mm -hmm. uh, starting to, uh, uh, to uh, getting into recession, the impact to, on, on the rest of the world is absolutely enormous. So what would be your assessment uh, on, uh, I mean, in terms of the demands of justice at the local and global level, uh, your assessment of this economic crisis? What has been the cost uh, regarding the, the demands of justice? of this economic crisis, both for developed countries and for developing countries. You said earlier that, in fact, developing countries were not so much affected. I mean, not, not, not all of them, but uh, I mean, what we observe is that in many countries uh, in the world, the uh, rate of growth of uh, uh, GDP and, uh, let's say, economic welfare uh, slowed down because of the crisis. Now, it did so more in some countries than in, than in others. I said that uh, in Africa, because uh, the African financial system is less developed and less integrated because of that with uh, international uh, capital movements, then they were more or less immune mm -hmm. from the financial impact of the crisis. But then they were affected by the fact that there was a recession and because of that, uh, uh, many countries reduced their imports, particularly of uh, basic commodities, and because of that, they were, they were affected, but less than, than, than others. But uh, you could say that uh, even though they have not been very much affected, the fact that they had no responsibility whatsoever in this crisis, and that because of that, they lost a few percentage points of uh, growth. Which is very important. For which them. is very important for them. Of yes. course it is very important for them. Uh, when you are poor, yes. uh, uh, anything uh, which is reducing your level of income is uh, completely dramatic. You feel it even more. 
exactly. So uh, uh, there was no way or no uh, uh, compensation uh, uh, around that would allow uh, the, the, glo the, 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 the global community to compensate those people for this, uh, for this, uh, for this. What we can say is that the International Monetary Fund had some facilities to lend money to those countries, very little. But after the crisis, then uh, the fund decided that it was really very important to have some resources available to intervene as quickly as possible to support economic activity in countries which would be caught in this kind of spillover effect. Yeah. So from that point of view, the financial crisis had a good effect in the sense that there is a little more insurance uh, 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 around for, for those countries. It is very, very yeah, limited. We'll go back to the matter a little bit later because... Uh, it uh, is very, very limited. Yeah, and, uh, yes. I'm not uh, saying that uh, this is a big thing. Yeah. Uh, we, we would need much, much more than that. But at least uh, you have the, the, the beginning yes. of something. You, you introduced the notion of responsibility talking about the fact that developing countries had nothing to do with the crisis, they were responsible for it and, they, and yet they were somehow exposed to it. So what about the, the notion of responsibility in the context of uh, the, the banking sector, uh, you know, which was at the core of this whole matter? And um, you know, how do you argue about the fact that uh, okay. uh, this actor should be socially and economically and politically responsible? No, definitely there are responsibilities in the banking sector and the financial sector. People took uh, too much risk, uh, or people didn't realize what uh, uh, was going on, what they were doing, that there were some systemic risk mm -hmm. in, uh, in the system. And because of that, they continued uh, with their own business, making a huge amount of money, and uh, uh, at the same time, increasing the probability that uh, the whole thing would, uh, would break down at uh, some stage. But what I would like to insist upon is uh, I mean, I'm not, I don't want to uh, reduce the responsibility of those people. I mean, there is no doubt there, was, there is responsibility. And with time, we'll know more and more about those people. And uh, I used before the, the, the word uh, predation. It is, to some extent, truly a predatory uh, kind of uh, behavior. This is something very important. Uh, but it has always been very difficult to uh, fight this kind of, uh, of behavior. Another element which uh, goes back to globalization, which is important in, for understanding uh, this crisis, in the fact that globalization meant that you have all those capital movements in uh, the world. And uh, there is a responsibility from, by the uh, International Monetary Fund, to some extent by the World Bank, uh, in uh, recommending that capital movement should be completely free. Now, uh, what did happen over the uh, 20 years uh, before the crisis, or in as more... As a way to, 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 to favor investment and so on and so on. In, in, as, 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 as a way to make sure that the capital would move yes. where it is most needed, yes. and therefore this would increase production in, uh, in, 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 in the world. Now, if we look at big capital movements before the crisis, what we observe is the fact that we had... Uh, a big saver in the world, which was China and Asian countries in general, which were saving a lot of money and needed to put that money, invest that money somewhere. And we had big borrowers uh, or big uh, de-savers, which were the United States. And uh, for a very long time, you had this huge amount of money flowing from China to the United States, the Chinese people basically uh, financing the deficit of uh, U.S. Uh, consumers. Yes. And the way in which uh, the U.S. was able to grow very quickly uh, in the 2000s before the crisis was to some extent due to, to, to this help uh, coming from, from China. But the Chinese needed to have somewhere to, and, to, and, to, to and, invest. And the U.S. was the best place where, where to invest. And the, inv the U.S. was a, a good place to invest because they were sure that there would be uh, no big uh, problem that uh, the uh, U.S. government would always repay the money uh, that uh, they were uh, borrowing. Uh, you know that uh, some time ago, some uh, uh, notation agencies said uh, maybe uh, the Britain agencies said maybe this is not exactly the case. Uh, but this explains what, uh, what happened. But at the same time, it is true that there was a, a kind of uh, excess uh, savings in the global economy. And uh, this contributed to lower 
rates of interest to make money much cheaper. And one of the reasons why it was so easy for US bankers and UK bankers, etc., and the European bankers to take risk with the subprimes, etc., etc., was basically because the money was extremely cheap. Available and cheap. And when you have available money, cheap money, you are taking much more risk than it would be the case if money is expensive. We already have seen that just after the first uh, oil crisis in the 70s. We had in the uh, early 80s, we had the big uh, debt crisis of developing countries, which was due exactly to the same uh, causes. Now, this time, instead of being uh, focused on the developing countries, the, uh, yeah, the, why is the it excess uh, uh, borrowing yeah. was on the side of uh, But the why US. is it that this money, which was available uh, in such huge quantity, was not really invested as a way to uh, help for the development of developing countries? Okay, so this is, so a, very, uh, this is a very good question. And uh, uh, this is basically because you have capital movements uh, in the world, uh, but uh, capital markets are not uh, perfect. So, but, but how do you align precisely uh, the, 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 the quest for private, intra for, for private benefits and uh, long-term strategic needs of developing countries? Because, you know, you are telling us that all this money was uh, available. It could have been put to very good use in Africa and elsewhere, and it wasn't. So why is it the case, and how do we make it happen? Because I guess that for the way forward, it's important. The uh, answer to that question is simply that markets are not uh, well developed in uh, uh, some of these countries, in particular in African countries, which means that for an investor there is a huge risk in the sense that maybe there are very good investments to be made in those countries and we are absolutely convinced that this is the case. Uh, but there is also a risk that the money which is uh, being lent or invested in some uh, business in those countries will not be well used mm -hmm. and they will be losing. So risk is the uh, magic or the, uh, 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 I could say that, uh, the, it's a bad word in, uh, but, in, in, but, in this. But, but, but by staying away from this risk, they created another huge of course. and perhaps bigger systemic of course, risk. Of course, of course. So and, and here you can see, and again, we are here in, in the situation I was referring to externalities, to those spillovers between the countries. This is exactly that. I mean, w people have recommended free capital movements but they didn't realize that as long as capital markets at both national and international levels were not working properly, capital movements could yeah. be very dangerous so, and uh, capital would, could flow in directions which were not uh, the best one. From, uh, not the optimal one. Uh, not the optimal one. From, I, mean, I mean, it's difficult uh, to say uh, optimal or not. I mean, you could say that uh, if you have in mind the welfare of the global community, yes. you're absolutely right. Absolutely. Not the optimal yeah, one. Yeah, absolutely. If you have in mind the welcere of a US citizen or French citizen or a British citizen, it may be a different but, but story. But in the end, did, did you know, this, uh, this uh, allocation of resources uh, elsewhere than developing countries served in the end U.S. citizens or, America or, or French citizens, did it? Yeah, it did. Okay, but, of I course. Mean, and, and yet we're exposed to the crisis. Uh, and, then, and more than that, I mean, it uh, favors... So on the long run, does it? Uh, yeah, I mean, I'm, okay, in the long run, probably, uh, probably not. I mean, okay, we, we are really at the, at the, uh, here t touching about a very sensitive issue. Uh, which is, uh, when we talk about capital movements, we tend to make a distinction between two types of capital movements. We have uh, uh, financial capital and we have real capital. If uh, a company decides to go to uh, Rwanda and to invest in some uh, new plant in Rwanda, uh, which will be producing textile or whatever, uh, this is a real investment. This is a real capital yes. movement. Okay. Mm -hmm. This is new production potential which uh, appears. When investors in uh, some banks or some investment funds in uh, the US or in uh, Europe say, I will put some money in the, uh, uh, in the stock market in uh, Nigeria, it is a different story yes, because yes, yes. Uh, basically they are uh, trying to get uh, uh, money or to make profit out of uh, 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 exchanges or uh, movements which are not always based on true yeah, yeah. physical mm -hmm. investment. And the danger uh, is precisely that, it is precisely the fact that those financial capital movements, because they are not well articulated with real needs, with real investment opportunities, 
uh, may uh, sometimes lead to uh, uh, problems yes. and inefficient allocation so, so of how resources. Do you, how do you align uh, financial capital movement with long-term public interest, including the one, the, 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 the welfare or the, 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 of the global community? How do you? I guess it's a key question for the future. No, no, it's a key question. So how do you go about this? What would be the mechanisms? What would be the institutions? What would be the policies for this to happen? I mean, the first thing would be uh, to uh, try to reduce the mobility okay. of uh, uh, the, this capital. I mean, to make sure that when people have decided that they would put their money in a given country, maybe in the stock market in that country, they know that it is for good, that they'll put their money there, that it will stay there for quite some time, and they will not uh, uh, take the money away uh, because there is some blip in the, uh, uh, in the economic uh, life of, uh, of, of the country. Uh, in order to do that, this goes against uh, the recommendations that many people did uh, in the past. This goes against free capital yes. movement. Basically, the idea is to uh, introduce some barriers, not too high, but some barriers which will simply uh, make capital movements a little uh, less uh, important, uh, uh, which will make uh, capital to flow uh, more, uh, much less rapidly uh, any time there is any small uh, advantage, some small profit to be made, or any time that there is the perspective of a loss uh, to be to, to And be is, there, is there political traction for this to happen today? Yeah, I mean, uh, many countries have started uh, okay. doing that. I mean, mm -hmm. uh, in some countries, like... Uh, okay, first, in some countries, like uh, the UK, uh, there has been uh, this uh, kind of uh, tax any time that you are buying uh, uh, stock. Uh, there is a tax, and uh, this is more or less the, 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 this uh, philosophy. But in some countries, like Brazil, like uh, Chile, uh, because of the crisis, you have more and more capital which flew to those countries because uh, they thought that it would be more profitable to be uh, invested in Brazil than to be invested in Wall Street or to be invested in London. Uh, they, are, they are afraid, or they were afraid, that some of these uh, 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 movements would affect them. When this capital will move out of the country, yeah. there may be a lot of problems. So they decided mm -hmm. that they would, be, they would put some taxes mm -hmm. when getting in. And uh, because of that, there is certainly much less uh, capital. So, so, so what, one, 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 one recommendation coming from you is uh, limiting capital volatility. If you exactly. Know. So ah. that's one element. What could be other, another element or other element? Uh, and then make sure that uh, uh, in uh, most countries there is some true transparency in the way in which uh, financial markets work. And uh, there is uh, transparency in the kind of signal that financial mar markets are sending in terms of what is happening in the real uh, economy. If we can, uh, if we can uh, be sure that uh, financial the profitability on financial markets reflects profitability uh, in the real economy, then we may expect that capital will indeed flow where mm -hmm. the, uh, it is most productive, okay? yeah. uh, which is not the case uh, today. Yeah. So it is uh, almost uh, uh, contradictory, but it is not. It is to say that today, because capital markets are not working very well, make sure that uh, capital uh, is not too volatile, yes. uh, but at the same time improve the way in which uh, financial markets work in developed countries and in developing and, countries. And so how do you, because, and, and I guess it comes down to incentive in a certain way regarding the, 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 you know, the, the, the markets. I mean, how do you create incentives for, to, to, for, for markets to, to see that it is uh, the right thing to, to do, quote unquote, to invest in developing countries in Africa, for instance. How do you, you know, orient uh, this money towards where it's needed? The point is not so much to orient it, I mean, to give incentives. The point is to show that it is profitable. Yeah. So, but but uh, so it is not an incentive. Simply, it, 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 the problem is, is a problem of information. Okay. The information is not available, mm -hmm. or the risk for uh, foreign investors to put money in some uh, African countries or some Central Asian countries. I mean, they are not 
poor countries are not only yeah. in, uh, in, yeah, in yeah, Sub-Saharan yeah. Africa. Uh, the risk is too important and then people don't go there or they go there only if the return is absolutely enormous. When I'm saying improve the working of the financial market, mm. this is reducing the risk that is felt mm. by foreign investors. So I guess uh, it, it puts some, some requirements on, on developing countries but also perhaps on, on international institutions. Of course, yes, so, of course. So what would be the things to do for developing countries eager to attract capital and what would be the things to do for international organizations to, to, to harness uh, but this improvement? In international organizations could uh, first uh, provide, the IMF and they can provide uh, technical assistance yes. in uh, uh, the way in which uh, the financial sectors is organized. Mm -hmm. They have a lot of knowledge about uh, these, they have a lot of experience. I'm not sure that uh, their uh, advice is always uh, completely neutral. We know that in the past, when they uh, said that capital movements uh, were free capital movements was uh, the best thing to do in the world, they were uh, somehow uh, wrong, uh, but they learned and uh, they can help countries to improve their financial markets. And today, I would say that uh, uh, those people in those organizations are more reasonable and uh, they know that it is important in some cases to limit the volatility or the uh, fluidity of uh, uh, capital movements and then they will help those countries to find the tools, the instruments which will allow them to control uh, the uh, entry and the exit of so, the So you capital. feel that in the past two or three years, uh, uh, in terms of trying to allocate resources in a better way, uh, the, 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 the views of the World Bank, of the, MA, of the IMF are more enlightened, quote-unquote, and there is perhaps a dialogue taking place between the market and these organizations as a way to allocate resources in a more optimal fashion. Yeah. You think that significant progress has taken place? I think that significant progress is taking place. Yes. I'm not sure that has taken place, but uh, is taking place. But there is something else. There is also the uh, new regulation of financial markets in uh, developed countries. Mm -hmm. The fact that uh, you're asking uh, banks uh, to have uh, 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 much more uh, uh, equity, uh, I mean their own funds, uh, in uh, relation with uh, the money that they can borrow, uh, mean that uh, uh, those uh, uh, companies, those financial institutions, will have less resources to put in the international market. When it was absolutely very easy uh, with one uh, dollar, one euro, to uh, borrow uh, 20 uh, or 100 euros and 100 dollars, you can see that it was very easy to get money and this money would flow immediately where, to places where uh, those finance, financiers thought that there would be some profit to be made. Uh, okay? yeah. Now, if instead of uh, being able to uh, borrow 100 with one, you are, yeah. you are able to borrow only 20 with one, yeah. you see that immediately the uh, volume of yeah. uh, this kind of flow will be, so, will be so, reduced. So a lot of uh, resources available can be a curse in a way. Uh, if it is not properly allocated. Of course, yes, of course, yeah, of course. And, and to some extent what did happen in uh, uh, 2008 and 2009, uh, or before that, was exactly that. Too many, uh, too mm -hmm. much resources. Too much resources which were obtained through what, is what we call the leverage. Uh, the leverage being that uh, with uh, one, uh, 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 one coin in your pocket, you are able to yeah. borrow 100 and, and, coins. And, and such leverage is being uh, uh, tamed and reduced at the moment. I mean, in the past uh, two or three years, somehow we're working on trying to address this problem. And the uh, new regulations, uh, which are still being discussed, but uh, for example, what you have in uh, uh, what is called Basel III uh, and uh, other uh, types of, uh, of uh, uh, new regulation go exactly in that direction. Okay. Now, I'm not saying that things will be perfect. So you're saying that uh, there is a need for this kind of uh, reform. Uh, I think that the community understood uh, many things. Uh, so we are going in the, in, in the right, direction. right direction. Now, is it the okay case that because of that, there will be no more crisis in the future? I would never say anything like that. Uh, it is in the, in, in the logic of the global economy to, uh, uh, to invent new uh, uh, ways of uh, functioning uh, with time because there is technical progress, because uh, the context is uh, changing. So something which uh, will work for a while in a given context 
might not be working anymore yeah. in another context. But so, so, uh, so listening to you, and this is not my field, so, so the, the key is to really find uh, ways through which you can really uh, allocate resources to generate strategic growth all around. That's the overall goal, right? The other goal is that uh, there are resources, and those resources must be allocated in an efficient way, where they are most profitable. Uh, now, uh, the problem is that you want to do that, but there are risks, uh, and uh, uh, it would be a good, a huge progress if we were able to uh, reduce the risk element mm -hmm. uh, uh, contained in investing in uh, developing yeah. countries. And so in developing countries, how do you uh, uh, go about managing this risk? I mean, uh, uh, so that precisely it becomes attractive to invest in these countries. What is required for these, for these countries to become attractive for, for people who have the, the money to invest? I mean, many, uh, many things. I mean, one thing is to have a financial sector which is not, uh, uh, which is functioning in a uh, rather uh, efficient way, which is sending the right signal. But more than that, uh, if you, you need to have a good uh, macro policy, you need to have a, a good uh, a business environment, making sure that if a, uh, an investor comes in, wants to create a, a company, wants to hire people, uh, this uh, uh, investor will not have to bribe uh, yeah. uh, people in the government. And uh, uh, so all this, I mean, the transparency, of uh, business and economic activity is something which is central. And a lot of progress have, uh, have been made in many countries. When you look at the way in which business goes in many countries and you compare to what it was, uh, let's say, in the early 90s, not, not a long time ago, there is a real progress. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, now, is it enough? Probably not. I mean, you need some time. In many cases, you need uh, a change in culture. And, and which uh, a change in culture which brings about a sense of consistency and re reliability exactly. and predictability. Yeah, exactly. This yeah. is key. Yeah. Uh, we, we started the conversation with, with, with uh, environmental issues. Uh, in, in, in a year or so, we're going to have Rio plus 20. Mm -hmm. So, how do you go, how, you know, how, how do you see things unfolding in this context of uh, uh, the global economy, global justice, and uh, Rio plus 20? Now, I believe that Rio plus 20 is uh, extremely important because, uh, you know, I mean, I'll, okay, l let me for, give you, uh, make a remark, which is a side remark for, for, for a while. The problem in the global economy uh, of globalization is the fact that you have a globalized uh, economy, but we don't have a global community. Yeah. And, and because of that, we don't have global governance. And, and it's no global policy and so on. Exactly. Okay. okay. Now, look at the way in which national communities were formed. Okay. All the historians will tell you that uh, the way in which uh, nations were built was basically because there was some kind of uh, aggression from uh, outside the, uh, the community which forces uh, people to get together and uh, maybe to fight the enemy or to uh, solve uh, some uh, natural disaster problem. But uh, always uh, the sense of the community is coming from the fact that uh, a group of people have to uh, uh, unite to react uh, to some uh, uh, external uh, aggression. Okay? Uh, today, I would say that the external aggression at the global level is the environment. Mm -hmm. We, it is not uh, an aggression from March. Mm -hmm. uh, it is uh, uh, simply uh, uh, the fact that uh, uh, the uh, globe uh, has uh, some limited resources in terms of uh, atmosphere, and we need a collective reaction to that uh, difficulty that we are facing at the global level. And because of that, I believe that this is where global governance, uh, the sense of a global community can come in, when people will realize that uh, uh, if they don't do something together, it is not the fact that uh, uh, some uh, uh, Luxembourg, is, uh, uh, Luxembourg citizen uh, will be affected or the U.S. citizen will be affected and the Rwandan uh, citizen will be affected. It is the case that everybody will be affected and it is in their interest to, to have a joint yeah. uh, strategy to fight uh, that kind of, uh, so, of, of danger. So, so because of that, I believe that this is probably where things going toward a global community, global uh, uh, governance, a global government to some extent might start is exactly in this area of environment. So, so you, you, in fact, you, you are saying that uh, uh, environment could be the entry point yeah. 
for, 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 for this to happen because of course at the normative level we have such commitments to the global community in the field of human rights and so on and so on but of it's not, uh, in development but it's not really happening no because this is for the moment it is at the level of uh, principle yes uh, and uh, there is no and, and, and because perhaps the, the threat is not shared you know, when we talk about University of Human Rights, it's uh, human rights in, in Africa, in, in, in countries in conflict, but in, in America, in, the U in Europe, we're quite comfortable, so we don't really share a threat. But when your argument is that when it comes to environment... This threat... Is shared. Is shared. It's for everybody. Yes. So, ah, it's an interesting point. So, um, uh, and so, so you feel that actually this, uh, this issue could become so... could be viewed as so strategic that it could trigger exactly. some systemic changes. Yeah, yeah. No. And uh, so how do you go about... You know, but it's more or less the same story as uh, the creation of the United Nations. Uh, I mean, the, the, the ancestors of the United Nations, the nation uh, society, after World War I. Uh, World War I had been an incredible uh, uh, massacre. Uh, then uh, people said, uh, we want to avoid uh, this to happen again, because this is not only Germany and France and the UK and the, the US uh, uh, losing people. It is really the, uh, more or less all the world. Uh, then there was this uh, push toward the uh, society of, uh, of, uh, of nations. Uh, it did, because there was a threat which was felt to be a threat to the whole world. Yeah. Okay? Uh, now, we learned that, uh, uh, we know now that uh, big countries will not uh, uh, get into a war against each other, etc. So we, we, we don't believe that there is any risk of this type. So we cannot rely on this kind of threat to, to move ahead uh, with uh, the global governance. But I would say that the real, uh, uh, the true and uh, uh, difficult uh, and dangerous threat really is uh, mm -hmm. on the environmental side. So, so in essence you are saying that the, the notion of shared threat is key for the possibility of triggering a sense of global community, global justice, therefore... Okay, I mean, when we talk about justice, we must make sure that... Uh, we make a distinction between what I would call uh, normative justice and positive yes. justice. Normative justice is what you just said about human rights. Yes. There are principles. Uh, uh, in terms of, uh, no, uh, in normative uh, terms, the fact that there is inequality in the world is something which is deeply unjust uh, and uh, should be uh, remedied. Now, uh, the problem is that you may have, some people may have this sense of justice, but positively, who is willing to really do something to go in that direction? Yeah. This is a positive aspect. And the positive aspect is more political economy. Mm -hmm. Where is the political economy interest for leaders in some countries to do this, to do that, which will contribute to mm -hmm. global justice? The threat yes. is the one uh, is a trigger. Okay? Mm -hmm. so, uh, in all these issues, I mean, maybe it is not a very, uh, uh, what I'm saying is not very idealistic. It is very, very uh, real, but I, uh, because, maybe because I'm, a little, I'm already a little old, but uh, what I learned is that uh, you don't do very much with only principles. Mm -hmm. You need uh, people to have an interest in doing things. And this threat is really uh, what I believe may trigger mm -hmm. uh, something at the global level. And, and, and so, in light of this, I mean, how do you assess uh, the, the current debates on this matter? I mean, you know, Copenhagen was not really a success, Cancun was, uh, you know, uh, neither a success nor, nor a failure, and then we have Rio plus 20. I mean, uh, what do you think about the, uh, the, the, the assessment uh, coming from member states on this shared threat and their commitment to do something about it? I have a feeling that uh, today... You think that there is gradual progress? Yeah, yeah, I think. And, you know, I mean, I agree that Copenhagen was not a, a success yet. There was a, something important in Copenhagen that, for the first time, many countries recognized that this was really an issue. The United States uh, said so. Now, we know that uh, Obama has not been able to, uh, to do very much in, uh, in the U.S. The Chinese have said so. The Chinese are much more serious today Yes. on uh, this issue than they were uh, five years ago. When you look at the last uh, uh, five-year plan in, uh, in China, uh, uh, the environment is really uh, a, a key priority in, uh, in, in the plan. So they are serious about uh, this. And this really, to some extent, is the consequence uh, of uh, Copenhagen. So Copenhagen was not a complete uh, failure. Uh, something has happened. Now, the problem is to try to go beyond that 
And beyond that, uh, people uh, will want to do things, but at the same time, they don't want to lose power. Yes. They don't want to lose some advantage that they have. Look, I mean, if we look at this issue of uh, environment, the big polluters in the world are the United States. I mean, the big national polluters are the United States and China. Uh, and at the margin, China will be a, a much more important polluter than the U.S. because of the rate of growth uh, and the size, of course, of, uh, of, of, of China. Now, behind, I mean, you could say, okay, if those people are getting uh, an agreement, things are done. But behind that, I mean, we, because we are in political economy uh, 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 territory, uh, you have other considerations to take into account than environment. In particular, geopolitics yes. play a huge role. It is completely clear that the U.S. Uh, does not want to see China becoming too powerful too quickly. So, and they have in mind that if they uh, accept to uh, a less uh, to, to to get into a deal uh, on pollution, so that they will be emitting less CO2 in the atmosphere. And there will be some compensation given to the Chinese so that they will be still be able to grow rather quickly in order to catch up with the rest of the world. They feel that at the same time they are giving more power to the Chinese. Yeah, so this is the difficulty it's we a are in. Business. Yes, and, and it is politics or political economy. Yes. Mm -hmm. uh, and, uh, but the day where the threat, look, a very interesting and very encouraging situation has been the uh, crisis and the London G20 summit. Mm -hmm. There was a big threat for the global economy, and in a few uh, days, all those people agreed on the fact that it was absolutely urgent to get into some kind of contracyclical uh, policy, that it was very important to put all the liquidity that was needed in the global economy, that it was important to get into expansionary uh, fiscal policies, etc. This was done, to some extent, very easily. Yeah. Okay. Now, because there was a threat, it was an obvious threat, mm -hmm. the important point with Rio 20, plus 20, is uh, to make sure that uh, uh, people are more and more aware uh, of, of, uh, of that threat. Of the sense of urgency. Exactly. And precisely on this specific matter, I mean, uh, do we have enough clarity coming from science? Uh, it seems to me that, uh, yes, I mean, at least uh, uh, scientists are uh, telling us uh, about uh, the risk that uh, we, uh, we, we, we have. Uh, I know that uh, there is some uh, uh, people, some disagreement in uh, the community. There will always be a disagreement in the community. But uh, the model uh, which uh, is uh, used to, to show uh, the impact of uh, human activity mm -hmm. on the environment is uh, pretty uh, credible. It is not new. It has been uh, on. For, it has been in the discussion for uh, quite some time. What is new is the huge amount of uh, uh, of pollution that uh, we emitted mm -hmm. in the atmosphere. And, and so the facts, the science, uh, are clear enough uh, so that policymakers can really acquire the sense of uh, of urgency for them to do something. I, I think so. Yeah. Uh, I, I really think so. And so perhaps as a way to to finish our conversation, institutions. You just alluded to the the role of the G20. So. What could be, what would be the, the, the right actors, the right institutions to, to really somehow uh, monitor and, and facilitate uh, this, uh, this uh, action based on sense of urgency? Uh, uh, I would say that uh, the day people will be convinced that uh, uh, urgency is such that action is absolutely needed, then uh, an institution like the G20, or maybe something slightly bigger than the G20, the United Nations, mm -hmm. uh, I mean, the G20, in any case, uh, if they are making uh, important decisions, everything will go back to the United Nations one way or another. Uh, but uh, the will uh, of uh, doing something will be uh, such among all the countries that uh, they'll find uh, some, uh, some governance uh, instrument. It will not, be, not necessarily be something which will be uh, permanent. Uh, it might, it will be probably something which will be in the field of uh, environment only, but when this will exist, then it will be possible to expand out of that, and I believe that will have made 
the uh, first step toward yeah. a true global community. You, you served uh, for a number of years as a World Bank Vice President, so do you feel, so you have a good knowledge of, of the uh, international system in terms of its instruments and so on, so do you feel that international organizations work enough together and do you feel that uh, when it comes to the relationship between the G20 and international organizations there is complementarity or competition? I know that the UN and, and small countries tend to be a bit worried about the rise of, G of, the, of the G20, so how do we go about um, putting together a relationship which is optimal? No, I mean, it is. I understand that uh, the, the fear of by the UN and by small countries with G20. I mean, there is an issue uh, in terms of legitimacy yeah. of the G20. It's absolutely clear. At the same time, it is realistic to say that people who are really important from an economic point of view uh, in all the issues which where the uh, economy is important uh, must, uh, uh, if those people are not able to get together and to get an agreement, then no agreement whatsoever will be, will be possible. Mm -hmm. So I'm not saying that the G20 should be the ultimate uh, reference. I said before, the idea or the initiative might appear, or the uh, first discussion might be at the level of G20, but at the end, it, they need to go through existing international organizations or maybe creating yeah. new organizations or giving to existing organizations more power or more instruments in order to achieve some specific goal than it is the case of today. And from that point of view, the, the G20 may, is only a coordinating uh, body uh, which uh, may take or may suggest initiatives in the world, but at the end, you're absolutely right. I mean, we need something else than the G20. And, and precisely we're taping this conversation in Paris, and France happens to have the presidency of the G20. I'm sure that you are uh, speaking with colleagues from the, the government and so on. So what, what's the French agenda, perhaps as a way to, to end our conversation, what's the, what's, what's the French agenda on the G20 uh, for the time of its presidency, and, uh, and, and how are things likely to unfold? No, one thing I can tell you is that uh, this idea, the, the, the issue of the legitimacy of uh, the G20 is in the mind of uh, uh, people uh, in France, in the French government, working on the G20 agenda. It is a difficult issue. I'm not sure exactly what, what will happen, but I can tell you that it is in their mind. Uh, the priorities are not very surprising. Priorities will be on the financial side and the monetary side. And uh, President Sarkozy will uh, most likely say, look, uh, uh, we need to do something to make sure that uh, uh, we live in a, in, a, in a global economy which is more stable than uh, it has been the case over the last uh, couple so of years. So global awareness. Global awareness. So this will be part of it. Uh, there will be something uh, definitely on the volatility of uh, <coughs> commodity prices and in particular food prices and uh, oil and uh, all those old commodities. And... Uh, uh, I would say there will certainly be something on environment. Uh, I hope there will be uh, that, uh, given all what I've said, that uh, the last part might be the most important one, because I don't believe that uh, we can uh, do a lot of uh, immediate progress in the field of the international monetary or financial system beyond what is being done today. I don't think that uh, there is a lot to be done on the volatility of committee prices, except uh, providing insurance to uh, poor countries so that they are not too much affected when uh, there are huge variations of uh, those uh, prices, uh, which, as we said before, is something underway, but uh, it is still too, uh, not uh, uh, important enough. And uh, uh, yes, I, mean that, I believe this will be the three, the three major uh, points uh, on which uh, France will, will try to, to put the, 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 the emphasis.